Let's pray. Father, we, you have us left here amidst ruins of a world once perfect in which everything that lived and breathed and had being did nothing but exalt you and glorify you. But you have us here standing amidst ruins and yet in your mercy there are things all around us that are beautiful and glorious and fragrant and colorful and tender to the ear. There are shiny things all around us and we freely confess this day that indwelling sin in us would yet make us too attracted to those shiny things, too willing to place them on the throne of our hearts. And so forgive us and have mercy upon us and in our time together today, show us how to, to steward these gifts that you've left all around us for your glory and our joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Bethlehem is hard on the rich man. If I were to edit a video collage of Pastor John's messages on the rich and erase the audio track, we'd likely have a string of facial expressions that suggest that he's belching up a belly full of Brussels sprouts. <laughs> and that's bad, you know, because Brussels sprouts already taste like a burp when they go down the first time. The adjectives that, that modify our teaching on money are alarming and shrill. Hazardous, toxic, radioactive, dangerous, deadly, destructive, suicidal, and damning. It isn't really profane at me for, of me at all to say that this teaching is aimed at scaring the hell out of you. Yes. Bethlehem, Pastor John, other teachers and pastors here are all hard on the rich man because God is hard on the rich man. God's word is full of characterizations of wealthy fools and villains and indictments and admonitions and condemnations of would-be wealthy villains and fools. It doesn't take rigorous exegetical work to extract from the most ancient biblical writings the assumption on God's part that the rich, if left unrestrained by holy commandment and promised wrath, will always oppress the poor. In the Old Testament, Sabbath was established, among other reasons, to discourage exploitation through demand for ceaseless labor. Debts were canceled on a recurring cycle with strict prohibitions against gaming such a system. Property rights were routinely restored to, uh, to those from whom they had been taken. Indentured servants were liberated on a regular schedule. And as we'll see in a minute, gleaning laws were established to ensure that fields were not harvested so exhaustively that nothing might be left from which the poor might scavenge. In the books that follow the Pentateuch, the wisdom books likely contain the greatest amount of material related to money. The theme of delivering the poor from oppression of the rich is so evident that John Stott called the Psalter the hymn book of the helpless. Some of the harshest indictments against the rich were made by the prophets about so many men who had made riches their boast, neighbors their means, and the poor their exploits. But no one said more about money and said it more forcibly than did Jesus himself. He spoke more about money than he did of sex, of heaven, or even hell. The Lord stands astride the pages of the gospel, just waving his blood-stained arms like he's the survivor of the greatest collision of all time, which he is. And he's shouting, break, stop, swerve, turn, you're about to drive right into destruction. And he told them a parable, saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this, I'll, I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain for my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. 
But God said to him, fool, this night your soul's required of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Paul warned Timothy of money's temptation toward suicide. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And after the Lord tells the Laodiceans that they're so putrid to his taste that he wants to puke them up, he says, for you say, I'm rich, I've prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. The whole counsel of God from Genesis to Revelation is a counsel to plumb your souls rightly in relationship to money and possessions, lest you die lest you be damned. So it begs the question in a chapel series like this, is wisdom in stewardship then a matter of us staying as far away from money or anything or anyone who has anything to do with money as we possibly can? Is the Christian life a, a simple ascetic life of no personal property, void of creature comforts, zeroed out bank accounts, subsistence living, no financial game, a wartime lifestyle so austere that it eschews material wealth entirely and demonizes wealthy people stereotypically. Is there then any real difference between Christian teaching about the rich and atheistic Marxist teaching about class struggle? And the answer is such is not at all the wisdom of stewardship. Now, let me be clear. I do not know whether or not God intends that you will be financially successful in your life. He may or he may not. I do know that there is nowhere in the Bible in which he promises you earthly riches and anyone who suggests otherwise is preaching a demonic lie. But I want to emphasize that God may allow that some of you will be blessed with earthly abundance that is well beyond your neighbor's portion and even beyond your wildest imagination. Some of you will be allowed to steward earthly abundance. Believing and unbelieving neighbors will both regard you as rich in earthly terms. Now, as the fundraising officer of this school, I'm praying that God will allow some of you to become financially wealthy, especially some of you undergrads, because these dear pastors and ministers and missionaries and theologians, they're not going to be the ones shouldering the heavier burden of the schools or the global church's financial needs in future years, apart from the strength of their prayers, which we do not at all discount. There are some of you who, by God's grace, will build new buildings and hospitals, endow professorships, underwrite the founding of new colleges and seminaries with a single check drawn on accounts of extraordinary wealth with which God may bless you. We want some of you to be financially well off, but we want all of you to be rich toward God. In Proverbs 17, 8, it says, a bribe is like a magic stone in the eyes of the one who gives it. Wherever he turns, he prospers. The ESV Bible study note, footnote reads, this proverb observes but does not condone a fact of life. The wise person will ponder this reality and face it as temptation. Now there are people out there who are really capable at bribery and theft and swindling and they will make a lot of money doing it. And some of them will never be caught at it in this life. Wherever, it says, wherever he turns, he prospers. Then there's the man of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight 
is in the law of the Lord, and his, on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yield its fruit in season, its leaf does not weather. In all that he does, he prospers. Sleazy, crooked, briber with his fake magic stone, wherever he turns, he prospers. He does well. Blessed man, delighting in the law of the Lord, meditating day and night, yielding fruit in season and out of season. All that he does, he prospers. He does well too. These two passages kind of lay an ax to the prosperity gospel, don't they? Clearly there isn't anything at all about economic prosperity itself that suggests that anyone makes or gets more money by transacting with God than in not doing so. They both do well. So is it that they're doing well at different things? Well, it's true that true wealth is a spiritual condition and not a measurement of of earthly possessions. And it's also true that the Psalm 1 man's prosperity is in more than just his worldly assets. But I think we make a mistake if we conclude that the coin of the Proverbs 17 briber is necessarily always a different coin than the law delighting servant in Psalm 1, that they're always somehow prospering in different riches. Both of these men men, may well have large bank accounts. Run-of-the-mill teaching on evangelical Christian stewardship is in my mind too often superficial and incomplete. Make as much as you can, live simply, save for a rainy day, stay out of debt, tithe. It's not a bad template, it's a good template, it's a sound template, but stewardship is about so much more than your debts, your debits and your credits. It's less about the balance in your bank account and so much more about what it is in your heart that's keeping you alive to do and to say at all. Riches of any kind, meager or magnificent, are expressions of gladness. They're delight in what a person values most. Coins are not riches. The joys associated with those coins are riches. Coins are like like letters and characters that have no meaning at all until they're arranged in coherent words and sentences and paragraphs. It's been said, if if you see a person's calendar and their checkbook, you can tell a lot about what that person values most. Some of you may be allowed by God to own vast storehouses of worldly wealth. And when those storehouses are read, what statement will they make about the source and the object of your gladness and of the expenditure of your life? There are godly rich people all over the Bible. Joseph was rich, Abraham was rich, as were Isaac and Job. Zacchaeus the tax collector brought great, albeit ill-gotten gain into his new life with Christ. Joseph of Arimathea contributed an expensive tomb and embalming spices to verify the crucified, bury the crucified Lord. Lydia was a seller of purple. For goodness sake, she was a luxury goods retailer of her day. The Ethiopian treasurer would also have been a man of very substantial means. But they were not rich toward themselves. They were rich toward God. Remember, Jesus said, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Two kinds of rich people. One who lays up treasure for themselves, another who's rich toward God. One whose gladness is in things that will rust, be stolen, and eaten by bugs, and another whose gladness will expand in every direction and intensify in every respect forever and ever and ever. In a 2016 video message entitled Free From Money, Rich Toward God, Pastor John said, and I quote, money's a big deal to Jesus. There must be something really dangerous about money. He said, again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. My guess, he says, is a lot of rich people object immediately saying something like, no, it says the love of money is the root of all evil. Money's not bad. And then John says, excuse me? It's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, period. 
Not a rich man who loves his money. It's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And indeed it is harder. And money is dangerous. But it's not impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Were I to pick a character from the Bible as an exemplary rich man, one who was allowed by God to steer his camel through the eye of a needle, it would be Boaz, the kinsman redeemer of whom we're told in the book of Ruth. Now, we don't have time to read the whole book here, but it won't take you any time at all to read it entirely yourself before day's end. So spend some time with Boaz today. You know the story in the period of the judges, Elimelech, Naomi, and their sons leave Bethlehem because of a famine and sojourn uh, in Moab. Elimelech dies, the sons marry Moabites, the sons die too, leaving no children. Naomi heads back to Bethlehem with one of her Moabite daughter, daughters-in-law. Ruth gleans on a field owned by Boaz, who Naomi knows is someone who can redeem the property once belonging to her dead sons. She sends Ruth to ask Boaz to marry her, and after a closer kinsman redeemer refuses to do so, Boaz redeems the property, marries Ruth. They have a son who becomes the grandfather to King David. Boaz and Ruth are used by God to preserve the line of the Messiah. It's one of the great stories of the Bible. If you profile Boaz's wealth and his relationship to it as described in those four chapters, I submit that you'll have a more reliable manual of wisdom in stewardship than even the most knowledgeable Christian radio financial guru may supply. The editors of the ESDB study Bible say of Boaz, Boaz is a rarity in the Bible, a character who gets a uniformly positive portrayal. Most other characters reveal their flaws. Far from being a villain, this rich man is presented as an idealized male hero, a wonderful example, exemplar of what it means to be rich toward God. Let's look at that prophet. We'll open up the book of Ruth and we'll just follow along. Let's go start in chapter two, verse one. He was a worthy man. He had worth, spiritual and material. Yes, he had character and yes, he had essential dignity before God, but he also had material wealth, position and strength. He was what we used to call in the advertising agency business an HNWI. He was a high net worth individual in his day. Verse two, he had assets that produced income beyond just his personal labor. He was invested in real estate and in production. He owned fields and he marketed their output. He was obedient to God's commandments concerning that wealth. He held it lightly. He abided the gleaning laws that prohibit him from harvesting so exhaustively that nothing would be left for the poor to gather. He was compassionate, not oppressive toward the poor. He managed his assets towards God. Verse three, he employed other people, meaning he was willing to pay other people to do things for him. And paying other people to do things for you is a form of sharing and generosity and good stewardship. The man who says, I just can't bring myself to pay someone to do something I can do myself may be respectably thrifty and frugal, but he may also be evidencing a a claw-clutching parsimony on whatever small amount of wealth he has. Note here also that Boaz encouraged the spiritual well-being of the people in his employ, those with whom he worked. He was kind of an original faith at work guy. Verse four, he was personally attentive to the management of his assets. He was no absentee. He inspected, he managed, he made informed decisions involving those assets. Verse five, he entrusted responsibility to young people who were just launching into life and vocation. He wasn't so obsessively protective of his wealth that he couldn't risk allowing young, inexperienced people to handle some of it. Verse nine, in the light of the current hashtag Me Too movement, here's a rich man from centuries ago who was wise enough to understand that a God-honoring workplace is one in which a woman may labor without fear of harassment. Verse 10, he showed favor and generously provided employment to foreigners. That's Ruth's own term. His wealth embraced the sojourner and was shared with people of other cultures. Verse 11, he was on the other hand, protective enough of his investments that he paid careful attention to what was going on with them and around them. He inquired, even gathered intelligence about these new people who were showing up on the property. Verse 12, he saw himself as an agent of God's greater work. Verse 13, he spoke kindly to his servants, his co-workers. 
Verse 14, he was generous well beyond the gleaning law obligations in a way that would be like our being generous well beyond the welfare costs that we bear in paying taxes. Again, he did not clutch his wealth. He offered it, he shared it, he held it loosely. Chapter 3, verse 7, he was a pre-Christian hedonist. He ate, drank, and was merry in heart. He enjoyed the things of the earth. He enjoyed his gifts, mindful of their giver. Verse 11, he was no respecter of persons. He saw in Ruth the same, self-same quality we noted in him, worth. He calls the earthly poor Ruth worthy, a testament to the essential spiritual quality of real wealth. In his eyes, she was every bit as wealthy as he was. Verse 7, he was respectful of convention and tradition. He took off his sandal and says, this kind of respect for convention and tradition really is an aspect of good stewardship and financial relationships, not only in your indigenous culture, but particularly when you're outside of it. Verse 10, he was magnanimous, consistently doing good toward God and other people. The story does include by saying, you know, he arranged this skin scheme to win the land and get the girl but rather to perpetuate the name of the dead in this inheritance. All through the story, this rich man, Boaz, is motivated by doing good and being rich toward God and toward other people. Jesus told the Pharisees, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. That's John 8, 56. Abraham saw the glory of Christ. Later in chapter 12, when John records Jesus' evocation of Isaiah's earlier prophecy of the coming unbelief of the people, he writes, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. John 12, 41, Isaiah saw the glory of Christ. There's nothing in this story in Ruth that suggests that Boaz had any such prophetic gift Given the area in which he lived, he didn't even have access as the apostles did to the writings of the prophets. Boaz's richness towards God, his wisdom and stewardship was expressed in humble, trusting obedience to God's commands and promises without the fully orbed view that Abraham, Isaiah, and that you have. You have seen his glory. How much more glad ought you to be to arrange every scintilla of your wealth, material or spiritual, in a way to shout, hallelujah, good news, he's risen, we're saved, sin and death are conquered, our beautiful, glorious king has triumphed, we shall behold him and he shall reign forever and ever. In 2014, shortly after I arrived here, I asked Pastor John by submitting a question of my own to the Desiring God podcast. And the question was this, is it sinful to be a high net worth individual? What is the difference between desiring to be rich and skillfully, faithfully managing to accumulate wealth? Let's listen to what he said. So let's get the powerful warning against the desire to be rich out on the table and then clarify a few things about wartime lifestyle because there's where the rub is. So Paul says, 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we cannot take anything out of the world, but if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. That's about as strong a warning about the desire to be rich as I could imagine. So let me clarify what I'm talking about with wartime way of life. The answer to the question is no. Uh, a wartime lifestyle does not mean that you 
after providing yourself and your family with a modest housing, food, clothing, now you're obliged to give all the surplus away immediately. That's not what wartime lifestyle says. Rather, the, the call for a wartime way of life says, with a lot more nuance and complexity, uh, that the remainder of our resources so after you've provided for yourself those necessities, might be $10, might be $10 million left over. That's, that's the one that's being asked about. Um, what's, what's left over is managed, stewarded, for the good of others, the glory of God, the advancement of his saving and sanctifying and healing purposes in the world, rather than for personal aggrandizement. So that may mean a huge and immediate sacrificial gift. You may give all your surplus away when profits rise or you get a windfall or whenever. Or it may mean, no, you don't give it all away. You, you build a large capital reserve for starting a, a foundation or for accompanying, um, accomplishing some uh, larger, longer-term goal for the good of, of the culture, of the society. Wartime way of life, as opposed to merely simple lifestyle, is, is meant to call attention to the kinds of choices that are made when tanks and rifles and grenades and B-52 bombers are needed to defeat the Germans and Japanese in a war of, of aggression, World War II. The complexities think of it, of constructing tanks and rifles and grenades and airplanes were enormous and expensive. Factories for, for parts had to exist and massive paid labor force and logistical systems for transportation and delivery, all of it hugely costly. So, no, the answer is no. The building up of resources for the accomplishing of, of great and costly acts of love is not sinful. And, and it might be helpful just, just to draw this out a little more, not in relationship to any, any particular um, war, but rather ordinary business life in America. We, we live in a society in which many legitimate businesses depend on large concentrations of capital. You, you can't build a new manufacturing plant without millions of dollars in equity, and therefore financial officers in these big businesses um, have the responsibility to build those reserves, like they might sell shares to the community. And when the Bible condemns the desire to get rich, it's not necessarily condemning a business that aims to expand and therefore seeks larger capital reserves. Now, the officers of the business may be greedy. They may be greedy for personal wealth or for power, but they may have large, noble motives of how their expanded productivity will create jobs and benefit people with products and services. It's not necessarily a greedy thing to want to amass that capital for the expansion of a new of a new plant or something like that. Even if a person, let's just get it down to the individual, even if a person, because of his or her competency in business, is offered a, a raise or a higher paying job and accepts it, that doesn't automatically mean that he or she is driven by the desire to get rich. They may have accepted the job because they, they don't crave the power <laughs> or, the, or the status of, of luxuries, but rather they, they want to do good. They want to build an adoption agency or give a scholarship or send a missionary or fund an inner city ministry or something like that. So what Paul is warning against is not the desire to earn money to meet our needs and the needs of others. He, he's warning against the desire to have more and more money for the security and the ego boost and the material luxuries it can provide with, with no plan for loving other people with your, with your increase. That, that's what my effort to teach on wartime lifestyle is aiming to avoid. Now, 
That doesn't sound like Brussels sprouts to me, does it, to you? It's a sweet, fragrant, attractive, delicious description of a rich man or a rich woman who is rich toward God. Dear students, you're the shade trees under which Pastor John, your teachers, the saints of this church, our contributors are planting. Trees under which we know that we will not get to rest this side of heaven. You're the object of our generational contention for the faith, the ones given to the saints. We want you all to be rich toward God, so go. Be rich by his grace, for his glory, and your joy. You're dismissed.